Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we come before you as your beloved, as your children by means of Christ, and as students seeking truth by means of the revelation of your word and the spirit of which you have given. I pray that as we come before you as the gathering of the fellowship of believers, that your spirit will be present speaking through this preacher and that your truth would be made known. Give us understanding into your word which you have given us as a display of your love and care for us, which has been from before the foundations of the earth. We give you this time, open up before us now, Matthew chapter 14, that we might see you more clearly and know your love. We pray this by means of Jesus our Lord, amen. Go ahead and uh, open up to Matthew chapter 14. Last week's message was a bit of a marathon. I ended up calling it Eyes on Jesus. And we went through a number of things we unpacked. And this week is kind of what may have been originally intended to be the conclusion of that message. But that message went an hour in its own right. And so this morning you get the conclusion of that one. And if you look at the text, you'll see what I mean. We're going to be starting at, at the position of Jesus and Peter coming back to the boat. But as, as a means of introduction, if you recall last week, as we were going through the text of, of Scripture, I highlighted that most of the time that you hear it in churches, Matthew chapter 14, and really in, in our time and day and age, the Bible itself is usually preached to you as a story. And I want to be cautious in my criticism of it and highlight it as a positive criticism, not... One just meant to say, I, anybody, if you ever say story or anything, you know, you, you're wrong with the Bible. That's not what I'm intending to do. As a matter of fact, if you're reading it and studying it in literature and you're going through the story and, and you're seeing that in that, in that way, that, that's, that's fine. My highlight for the church was simply this. If we are striving for a consistent theology, a consistent study of God then you have to recognize that you are not in the Word of God studying a story of God. In the sense of, Father God has not called all of His children together and made this great fairy tale of type of stories. This, this movie and inviting you into the movie. And what we're studying is to learn what our part is in the movie. That is the wrong form and framework of study. You can study the Bible as a Liter literary writing and, and do that. But theologically and from the pulpit as a form of preaching to study it accurately, it is the Word of God, which is to be studied in understanding the Spirit of God that is the nature of God for the revelation of the truth of God. And so we pull out the words and we put them in the laboratory of our study to see what they are saying and come to a... Um, unified understanding of Scripture. We're students, always studying it, seeking God, recognizing our dependency on Him for His teaching and instruction. And I said, it seems like a battle of semantics in saying that, but it's an entirely different approach. We say often that we are to be students of theology, right? Or students and in the form of our student or our, our studying, we are um, little theologians, right? Each and every one of us. 
Not that we need a degree or anything else like that, but we are studying God, theology, the study of God. That is what we are doing. And in, in studying God and studying the Word of God to have a consistent doctrine, that's the form of study we're going for. And all I'm trying to highlight is when you are studying to find truth, as in study of anything, it is a science. It is a science. And the study of science is done a little bit differently than the study of literature. And that's what we're seeking in Scripture. And that's, that's the standpoint that I'm coming at this from, so that the walking on water, the storm, and the raging seas is more than a story. It's more than a story. It's more than a historical documentation, and that's usually where, where the line is drawn. You have some people who think it's just a story, and then Christians will come in and say, no, it's a historical document. And I'm taking it one step further. And I'm saying it's the Word of God, and the Word of God has been given unto us for a purpose, and that is to reveal unto us the nature and character of God. And our job in studying it is not to seek out the purpose and practical aspects of self, but the identification and the revelation of God. And in seeing that, something happens. And I think in describing it that way, that's when, um, and I don't know if this helps you or not, but that's when we step into the scientific laboratory. Because if we can begin to understand how the mechanisms, the Word of God is working together in that revelation, then those revelations have an effect upon the student. You see it, right? Working with your children, you're going through them, you're helping them with different lessons, different homework, different studies, and you see the light bulb go off at a different point. And they're different from the second before, right? Their reaction and their relation to what they're studying is different from just a split second before because of the revolu re revelation of what they just realized in their study. Now take that and multiply that by whatever factor you want to multiply it because you just made the subject of study God. Okay, so if the revelation is 2 plus 2 equals 4 and they're seeing how, you know, your little blocks work together to make that work and happen, now take that little bit of understanding where the child finally does it or reading. Have you ever been around someone who just learned how to put the words together and reading, all of a sudden they just keep reading through the books and they're so excited they want to show everybody. They want to go around and read for everybody. They want to tell everybody about the stories that they're reading. Take those things and put in the place of the subject, God. That's our study of the Word. And so, Jesus walked on the water during a storm after He sent the disciples away. And we said He didn't just send them away. He... he, he the word there is a forceful word of he put them on the boat. <laughs> he put them on the boat. When they were trying to send the multitudes away, Jesus said, y'all go get on the boat. They're on the boat. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the one who calms the storm, who stops the storm. Do you think it's such a far stretch of imagination to think he knew the storm was coming? And he put them on the boat. Right? And last week we said, and I don't think it's far stretched to think that the disciples, the ones who were fishermen, knew a storm was coming. And they're on the boat. And there they are. And then Jesus, after they're gone, sends a multitude away. And then he goes up, not to the boat, but he goes up to pray, just him and his father praying until the fourth night watch, which is just, just about sunrise. And then he says, it's time to go to the disciples in which in the midst of the storm and the wind, where the storm is contrary, the winds are contrary, he's walking out on the water. The disciples look out and they think, it's a spirit. It's, it's a ghost. It's, it's something. It's an illusion. It's there and then it's not. It, what, what is it? And Jesus says, take comfort. It is I. Don't be afraid. And Peter says, if it's you, if it's you, tell me and I can come out to you. And so Jesus says, fine, come on out, Peter. And Peter goes out, and he'll be the leader, and he'll show them 
what this is all about. And he gets far enough away from the boat not to be able to be pulled back into the boat and close enough to Jesus to be within his arm's grasp and realizes what he's doing. And that that's really kind of impossible. And he sinks. He cries out, Jesus, save me. Immediately Jesus reaches down and picks Peter up. And then you have the walk back to the boat. And I think that's one of the biggest parts that gets overlooked. There, there are seasons in life in which we hear the word of God and we consider ourselves as bold and the good Christian and the one who has really got everything together because we're getting out of the boat and going to prove something and to show something, to show our, our spiritual awakening or, or greatness or our spiritual maturity that we are the ones in the church that everybody else in the boat should be watching. And that often leads to our sinking. The Bible puts it this way, pride comes before the fall. Peter fell in water and sank. And Jesus lifted him up. The interesting part is the words of Christ to Peter is, Oh, you of little faith. But then Christ doesn't leave Peter. He doesn't say, Now, Peter, let me walk back to the boat while you swim next to me. He doesn't calm the wind. He doesn't calm the sea. In other words, the entire walk back to the boat, there is no circumstantial change. I don't know if, if you've picked up on that, but all of the nature circumstances around Peter at this time, there is no change. The only change is Jesus has displayed, Peter, I got you. And he's walking him back to the boat. Sometimes you can look at this and you can see how would you relate to that. I think if I'm relating to it at any point right now, I would say I'm probably that one walking back to the boat in this season in, in life. Walking back to the boat. Matthew chapter 14 verse 32 is where we pick up after all that has taken place. It says, and as soon as they, Jesus, Jesus and Peter, were come into the ship, the wind ceased. I pause here for a few observations, some of them we already highlighted. Number one, Jesus appears to have calmed Peter before he calmed the storm. He calmed Peter before he calmed the storm. He calmed the, the spirit, the panic of the disciple before any of the physical circumstances. There's a healing that takes place before any physical circumstance is changed. In other words, the mind of Peter was changed prior to the changing of the circumstance. There's an ultimate reality that's shown. That ultimate reality is not the wind, right? It's not Peter trying to explain to Christ, I could have done it, but all the wind distracted me. I started to look at the water. You know, the other guys behind me were, were really looking at me. I could feel their eyes in the back of my head, and that was distracting me. And so if you just would have changed some of the circumstances, I could have done this, Jesus. None of that ever happens. It is all Jesus, so that the... the Reality that's shown isn't that there was a circumstance problem. The reality shown is not the physical touch of Christ. The reality that is shown is the revelation of Christ. And that's what I want to unpack this morning. The faithfulness of his word is what is shown. It is a who is he. Now, if you're looking at this and you observe it, the who is he is brought to us and the word of God is this. Jesus comes out and he says, be of good comfort. It is I. Be not afraid. And then he says, O oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt? Those are all of the statements of Christ before walking Peter back to the boat. And so from it, you have revelations of Christ 
his nature and the effects of that nature upon us. Number one, the disciples should have known comfort, not question, not fear. Number two, they should have known who the I was. They should have recognized the identity of Christ. Not that it was Jesus, but who Jesus is. They should have recognized that. Because it is Jesus, and Jesus is who he is, the waves are not a threat. The wind is not a threat. Anything out on the water is not a threat because it's Jesus, and Jesus is who Jesus is. Be not afraid. It should have settled any and all fear. But then there's an identification of the physical nature and attributes of the disciples and us, the carnal nature. And those revelations are you of little faith. What is revealed here is no matter how bold we think our faith is, Peter getting out of the boat, or how conservative we think our faith is. The other disciples, I'm staying in the boat. The faith that mattered was the faithfulness of Christ, which kept Peter from drowning in his decision, which kept the boat from being pushed astray or flipped or anything else. It calmed the waves. And Jesus walked him back to the boat. So here's the point. In the same circumstance, you can panic in fear or worship in truth. In the exact same circumstance. Take the circumstance of the past two years. Your church can panic in fear, shut the doors, become a drive-in theater. Right? Come get your test here. Do all of these things. You can panic in fear. You can worry about everything that the world says the circumstance, the physical circumstances are. You can ignore that Jesus said, it is I. You can ignore that Jesus said, you are my beloved. You can ignore that Jesus said, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. You can ignore all of that in fear, get caught up in the storm and sink down. Or you can worship in truth. In the midst of all the circumstances, you can say, what does the Word say? Who is Jesus? What does He call us to do? So the truth proclaimed or declared by the disciples is going to end up simply being a truth realized is what we're going to see in this next verse if you go to verse 33. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. A few things we want to see in our laboratory of exploring what worship is. Number one, we see that worship from the disciples here is a response, isn't it? It's a great thing that's just happened. Jesus was, number one, walking on the water. Number two, Jesus saved Peter. Number three, Jesus walked back to the boat with Peter. Number three, Jesus was then in the boat. As soon as him and Peter were in the boat, the waves and the storm stopped. That all birthed a response, and thus worship is a response. And then Christian worship is... What we notice not a response to, it is not a response to the circumstances changed. Christian worship is a response to the truth of God realized. Why? Because they did not say, we worship you because you stopped the storm. We worshiped you because you calmed everything down. We worshiped you because you lifted Peter out of the water. They said, we worshiped you because it is true that you're the son of God. Their worship is a truth that is realized. Now, as we continue to explore worship, it's important here to point out there can be false worship. We are observing true worship in the form of Christian worship in the sense of what the Bible truly 
explains worship to be? How does it define us, give us understanding into godly worship? When you pull out the word worship and you try to define it, you can gain insight from the definition. But because of the nature of the word worship, the definition actually comes up rather lacking. It's, it's like trying to give a one-dimensional definition of a multi-dimensional word. The definition that is given, which is a good definition, is to pay divine honors, to give respect, or to give refer reverence. It's a good definition, does not give the entire picture that Scripture gives. Biblical Christian worship is more. It's been described by some as both an attitude and an action. We'll use that some, but I think that's still incomplete. So it's an attitude and an action, and because it's an attitude and an action, it's hard to get the fullness of it from simply saying to pay divine honors. The action... Or for the action, it is widely agreed that proper acts of worship are to be those things which are described in the Bible. All right, so if you were doing a study of worship, we say, hey, we're going to come together and we're going to do a few weeks study of worship and what worship is. As a matter of fact, we did this a few years ago. And what we're saying is when we, the fellowship comes together for worship, what are the actions that we ought to do? And the stance that we took as a church is, which is, is, really not controversial at all within the Christian church through the ages, the actions of worship ought to be those actions amongst the people of God which are described in the Word of God. In other words, the actions of the worship of the people of God are ascribed to them by God, not by their own imaginations, not by their own creativity. All right, this, this is why we, we've, we, we've said there ought to be some caution in the churches that would sit around and ponder together what things we can offer to God as worthy rather than studying the Word of God to see God as worthy of our worship. A good example of this would be Cain and Abel. And there's multiple other examples throughout the Scriptures. The example of the strange fire and, and offering what was not commanded by God to be offered. We as humans will look at it and say, well, that's good. They're trying to do a good thing. How can you say it's bad when somebody's trying to do a good thing? Simple. It's not what God said. That's it. You know, it reminds me, um, me and Dennis were, were talking just yesterday and we we're talking about God's sovereignty. And, and the way it kind of breaks down to me in conversations with God's sovereignty in, is three, three questions, right? Is God God? Your answer would be yes. Second question, is God good? Your answer would be yes. Third question, so what's your problem? Right To me, that is, and it's not meant to be just a, in conversation on it, it's meant to be a revealing questionnaire that I go through myself when, when you're going through things. Is God God? You all know when you're using the word God, Almighty God, you know what that means even if your flesh, your reasoning denies it. You know what it means for someone to be God. They are in what? Control. You know that. Don't overthink it. Is God God? Yes. Is God good? Yes. Isn't that good? Yes. What's our problem? Right? It's the same thing with worship. Is God God? Yes. Does God know how he ought to be worshipped? Yes. Would that be good? Yes. Why would we go outside of that? Is there something we know that God does not know? So, all of that, I don't want to get too far out in the weeds, but all that to say, it's generally accepted that the action of worship is that which is ascribed in Scripture. You've seen it. You've seen it in the Old Testament. You've seen people fall over dead because they did it wrong. What I'm offering this morning is it perhaps will benefit us if we utilize that same principle as true in the work of defining worship. 
meaning in order to define the heart of worship, the thought of worship, we stick to what God has described worship as in Scripture, at least in identifying the revealed elements of it. That is to say, we should sit, sick, stick to Scripture for them or for it. Let's walk through verse 33 to kind of fuller and more fully way pull this out. The, on verse 33, on the boat, we see that worship is more miraculous than what happened outside of the boat. There are two things in this life that Christ has opened up to us in the realm of worship sim in a similar way that he does to the disciples. And the reason I'm saying it's more miraculous is because, get this, you see somebody walking on the water. You're not sure who it is or what it is. You cry out in fear. That person answers you back saying, it's I, it's Jesus. Be comforted. Do not fear. That doesn't dawn on you the revelation of worship. It doesn't give you the truth of what's going on. So the fact that after all of this, they finally came to the point of understanding who Christ is as a son of God, that's the miracle. That fallen man is able to see the truth of God. We are so blind in the flesh. In John 4, 24, Christ's disciples declare something that he shall actually set in place for all of his beloved concerning his work, his purpose, and his worship. In John 4, 24, Christ declares that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This verse is speaking of worship in two areas. They are rather obvious. Number one, spirit. This is the nature of God, the nature of the Godhead. Not the Holy Spirit, but the nature of the Godhead. Number two is truth. Truth is defined as the reality of a matter. Now, in one sense, we see this type of worship in the boat. The nature of God is made known as present in Christ. He is sovereign. He is Lord over the waves, over the storm. He, he, he cares for the disciples. He lifts them up. He walks them back to the boat. He is in the boat. The, the waves and the winds, they stop in his presence. And thus the truth of Christ is made known. So the spirit, the identity, and thus the truth is made known. And in reaction to the truth of Christ made known, the confession of truth, and the reverential action is given, which is actually, simply put, the adherence to the words of Christ, finally confessing he is who he has been saying he is. And that's the worship action. So in the, the, the layout, the description, we see God reveals to his disciples who he is, God opens his disciples' eyes, whatever track they have to go through. One has to get out of the boat. The others have to witness it from the boat. Whatever track they have to go through, in the revealing of who he is, he opens the eyes of the disciples to see who he is, and the action and the attitude of worship is just simply and finally adherence to the words of Christ. They say what Christ has been saying. So that's kind of the example in, in, this, in the boat that we see. But the worship that we look at from the boat in amazement of, if you could put us kind of sitting in the boat, I believe is the fulfillment of John 4, 24. So it's a little bit different in this sense. Number one, those who shall worship him shall worship in spirit. You've been given a new nature. It's not carnal, but it's a very nature 
of the oneness with God through Christ. Number two, Christ declared, you shall worship him in truth. That is the truth that the carnalities of life and the life that takes place at, in, in the midst of a raging sea don't change the spirit and the nature that you have been given in Christ. The storms did not change who Christ was. He was who he said he was. The storms did not remove the disciples from Christ, and nor do they remove you or I. The identification of Christ and you and who you are in him is the truth realized, you could say, in your lifeboat or in your life's boat as you sit in your life. If I were to have to try to really summarize where I'm trying to go to, to lead us here, here in this, some of you could probably guess what I would point to next. Romans chapter 12. The amazing part to me of the walking on the water, Peter coming out, all of the different things that are happening and taking place, is that in the midst of all of that, what is recorded for us is the revelation of Jesus. It is true, you are the Son of God. And all I'm trying to say from that is, that's worship. It's to understand the nature and the truth of God. Romans 12 highlights that and the fulfillment of it within us the church. Romans 12 says, by the mercies of God. I would offer to you here that when you read it by the mercy of God, it would be not a far stretch and would be equivalent to saying, be of good comfort. It is I, be not afraid. When a address to the church is began, begun with the mercy of God, the kindness of God towards you, the love of God towards you, the comfort of God. It says, by that, give up or offer up your bodies. If you want the illustration here, if you were to continue to walk in yourself and not in the mercy of God, you will sink. In Christ, we repent. That is, we are taken by him back to the boat. We cry out, save me. Once Romans 12 highlights offer up, that means all of your, your thought, all your, your reasoning, what you think is happening and going on, the storm's raging, the sea's ra raging, this is what I must do, this is how life works, this is the, right, the, the pragmatism of it all is what we went into last week, this is how all that works, this is saying the mercy of God is the manner by which we live, give up on the carnalities of self, and it says don't fashion yourself like the world, that's all of that carnality, what will I, I need to, how can I, I'm going to merit, 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 but rather be metamorphosized or changed. That's the blow-up section that brings us to John chapter 4, verse 24. Be changed. Do you know what that's speaking to? A new nature. Observe the mercies of God, what is in the mercies of God? It's a new nature. Those that worship me shall worship me in spirit. What does the word spirit there mean? The nature of God. It is the identity of him. How? By the renewing of your mind. That is to say, think upon truth. That's it. What did Christ say in regards to your nature? 
I'll give you three words that you can think of whenever you want to ask that question. The three words that Christ said in regards to your nature that can open the floodgates as to the fullness of who you are are these three words. It is finished. In other words, the old is done away and the new has come. Think upon, seek out, know the truth of Christ. Don't let it be corrupted. Don't let it be bent. Don't let it be perverted into a world system of ideologies, pragmatisms, and so on, of things that you must do, things that you ought to do, things that define you and identify you as something else than merely with Christ walking through all the storms of life. No matter the circumstance, he remains the same. Why? So that you may prove what the good and perfect will of God is. Friends, let us conclude with this. We notice, we observe in the boat in the laboratory that we're trying to unpack this morning, that the saying of a truth Thou art the Son of God is the act of worship of the disciples in our text. I hope that somewhere in this sermon you can catch the marriage between worship, the truth and the mind, and the will of God. Worship, the truth and the mind, and the will of God. We are in an age in which worship is most often identified as the moving of a heart or emotion through an experience. And that's a wrong definition. It's not biblical. It's false worship. The heart is deceitful above all else. It, it's, worship is connected, married to truth, revealed in the mind and the understanding and is married to the will of God. Worship is married to the will of God in that worship is the will of God. Let me try to affirm it. Um, if we were to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, we would notice that there's a verse before it, which is 16, which says, Redeeming the season for the days are evil. And everybody loves to say, hey, I'm there. I understand that. And then verse 17, wherefore be not unwise. I'm offering to you, it is unwise to be conformed to the world. That's if we were to unpack Ephesians 5, I'm trying to do it in a quick manner. But if we were to go there, it would say, do not be conformed. The season is evil. Don't be conformed to the evils that are around you, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And if you remember not long ago when we were going through Ephesians, I said the Bible says understand what the will of the Lord is, which gives me the idea you can understand it by the grace and by the mercies of God. This morning, as we come to the end of the message, I want to offer to you that the will of God is rather simple, if that's an okay word to use here, in that it can be described in one word. Worship. Remember that when we started, I said worship is this multi-dimensional word that can't just simply be defined in, in, in a brainstorming manner of us ourselves, but when you turn to the Word of God, you see the fullness of it. The will of the Lord is worship. Worship is godly wisdom. In other words, worship is understanding applied. Worship is the understanding of God applied to God, which has a work within us that causes something, which is worship, reverence, honor to the holy God. 
You don't honor him and reverence him because you realize something wonderful about yourself. That's what the self-help preaching has all wrong. What do you do when you realize how wonderful you are? You engage in the worship of self. That's called false worship. That's called idolatry. But when you understand the truth of who God is and the truth of who he has proclaimed that you are in him, the work that he has done in you, that's the spirit, the newness of the spirit that he has made you in the nature with he himself, that he now sees you in the nature of himself, that he sees you now through Christ and not through the flesh and that which is carnal, you worship in that truth realized. You worship him not because you need to bring a sacrifice before him is what I'm saying. There was a time when in order to worship God, you would have to bring a sacrifice, sacrifice, come into his presence. But there's a time when they shall worship him in spirit, in a new nature, in a nature of oneness with God himself. How is it that we do that? You heard it in the disciples. You are the Son of God. It is true. So, the will of the Lord is worship. Worship is godly wisdom or understanding applied. It is living in the knowledge of the truth of God. It is the disciples in the boat. It is finally living and saying what God says is true. So, friends, to bring us back to where we started, in the same circumstance, you can sink in fear or worship in truth. You can drown in a merit system or renew your minds upon the mercy of God and prove out the good and perfect will of God. You can sit in every circumstance and say, is God God? Is God good? What's the problem? And that's what I hope we as a church will do in this season and the coming seasons. Whether we're in the boat wondering what's going on, whether we're just running out from the boat about to encounter that we can't do it, or whether we are on that walk back with Christ taking us into his arms, may we understand that it is true that thou art Christ, the Son of God. Amen? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we recognize that our life is full of that which we cannot do. And that's just talking about the physical. But even greater than that is a manner of worship which you have called us to. And yet I say, even not just called us to, but the manner of worship which you have declared shall be ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. A worship from a new nature and a worship from a divine truth. That through the preaching of your word, the, the proclamation of such things shall have such an effect that those who are yours, their ears hear it, their eyes see it, and their beings are changed, are awakened by it. May we stand upon that gospel message. May we be affirmed in it. And may these, your people, be encouraged by it. I ask by means of Jesus our Lord. Amen.